Very excited to introduce your next speaker. As you may have noticed, the theme of our day is dance. The dance of genes and environment, the dance of working with your, with your person, uh, the dance literally of movement and how that fits into things. Not everything today fits into those, but I just wanted to have a general theme. But it's, I've got to admit, part of that is because of our next, next guest. Because Dr. Cynthia Bulick is <laughs> one, of, one of those who has been so helpful to all of us in understanding certain things about the genetics of eating disorders. So I, I, we, I really felt like that was inappropriate, but also, She's a dancer, and she and I have talked many times about dancing together. We're not going to do it today. <laughs> but she is an ice dancer. I'm a tap dancer, so we figured we could work something out sometime, so it'll just have to be next time. Um, but um, I'm, I'm ready to, to say hello to the stage to Dr. Cynthia Bulick, who's the name of her, um, her talk is From Slow Waltz to Jive. Accelerating Discovery in Eating Disorder Genetics. And we have a song specially for Dr. Bulick. Do you have it ready up there? Thank you, Laura, and thank you for the wonderful music, and there's a reason behind that. If you look here, I spend half of my time in North Carolina and the other half at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, so of course I had to play an ABBA song in honor of Sweden. So um, as mentioned, the name of the talk is From Slow Walls to Jive. <clears throat> Accelerating Genomic Discovery in Eating Disorders. And I'm gonna take you through some science, if I can. Um, disclosures, I'm on the advisory board occasionally for Shire and have a services grant from Ubiome, and I'm an author for Pearson. And this is my gratitude quilt. Um, a lot of the research that you're gonna see has been funded by these different organizations and foundations. So I am gonna dive right into this, and I'm gonna give you a quick tutorial in genetics. Um, we know, and it is unequivocal at this point, that eating disorders do run in families and they're heritable. Um, and heritable means that between 48 and up to 62% of liability to these illnesses are due to genetic factors. Um, and this is really where I started my career. We're gonna bypass about 15 to 20 years of research. Um, we went down some dark alleys. We spent time doing big studies using techniques that we found out really couldn't get us closer to identifying which genes influence risk for eating disorders. There's a hand up in the back. Go back one slide so you can get the this one? Yes, thank you. Okay, sure. Say go when you're ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this one you don't need to take a picture of. Um, <laughs> And so we're gonna go straight to today's methodology, genome-wide association studies. What they are are large studies where you take a large number of individuals who have a trait or a disorder um, and a large number of individuals who are ancestrally compatible, so they come from the same um, ancestral background, and you compare their enti entire genome. So you slather a million markers across the genome, and you ask the question, where are the differences between the cases and the controls? I'm listening for the clicks before I move on. Um, the single most important thing in genome-wide association studies is sample size. Um, and this is something that we did not know early on. We did some smaller GWASs that we thought might have led to genetic discovery, but the sample sizes were way too low. So our crusade, basically, is to increase sample size for genome-wide association studies. This is exactly what you need to know to read the output or the results from a genome-wide association study. And what you can see here on the bottom, if I can find the clicker, these are the human chromosomes on the bottom. This is the significance level. 
And this red line is the critical line. Since we're doing over a million tests, we need to, we need to control for multiple comparisons because we don't want to waste our time looking at false positives. We want to know that the loci or the areas of the genome that we identify are actually worth spending money on trying to figure out what those genes do, how they interact, and what pathways they're in. So we're looking at 5 times 10 to the minus, minus 8. So when you look at output like this, what you want to look at, it's called a Manhattan plot because it sort of looks like the Manhattan skyline. Um, and a good GWAS, where you actually have results, will look like this, where you identify multiple places on the human genome that are associated with a trait. So this was our first study. Um, this was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry, 2017, I think. Laramie Duncan was our, um, was our analyst. The sample size for this was 3,495 people with anorexia, almost 11,000 people without anorexia nervosa. And you just saw a very dense Manhattan plot. This was a very sparse Manhattan plot. So this is that magical red line. And as you can see, um, we only identified one area of the genome that was genome-wide significant, but this was monumental for eating disorders because we had never done that before. And the interesting thing about this, and it's sort of going to harken back to some of the talks we had this morning, is this particular locus had also been identified in other studies of type 2 diabetes and autoimmune illnesses. And one of the things that many of the families might recognize is at least in a subset of people with eating disorders, their families also have sort of interesting and not necessarily homogeneous clusterings of autoimmune illnesses. But it was too small. This is still an itty bitty GWAS. So thanks to the Clareman Family F Foundation, um, they funded a large initiative called ANGIE, or the Anorexia Nervosa Genetics Initiative. And I know many of you have had family members or have participated in ANGIE yourselves. And this brought together four universities, Aarhus University in Denmark, Karolinska um, under Mikael Landen, um, and QIMR in Brisbane, and University of North Carolina, we were the center, and then we also got some help from New Zealand from um, University of Otago. We managed to collect DNA from 13,000 individuals with anorexia nervosa and 9,000 controls in three years. And the way we did that was just by activating the community. This was not like a white tower research project. We reached out to families and to patients and to advocates and activists and got everyone involved in the Angie um, in the Angie initiative. And what we then did is we took that first GWAS, we'll go back, 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 back. We took that first GWAS, we added in those 13,000 Angie cases. We found some more cases in the UK Biobank, which is an amazing resource where they're basically getting DNA and fMRI and all sorts of measures on thousands and thousands of people in the UK, as well as some samples from Wellcome Trust to build a sample size of almost 17,000 cases and 55,000 controls. Now, the results you're about to see um, are very fresh off the press. And in fact, we're really excited because this paper just got accepted in Nature Genetics. And I think it might be the first time there's ever been an eating disorders paper um, in Nature Genetics. And this is what I want to spend the next couple minutes talking about because it's remarkable and it gives me goosebumps when I see the next slide. So this was our Manhattan plot. As you can see, it's looking a little bit better than that first one did. We identified eight loci associated with anorexia um, with a heritability of between 11 and 17%. A shout out for Australia, Hannah Watson um, was our analyst for this paper. We stole her from Perth um, and she came to work at UNC, brilliant analyst. Um, this is interesting, that we have eight loci is interesting, but what's more interesting is that there's very valuable information below that red line. And you don't just want to look at those top loci, you want to understand what's going on under there that influences the genetics of the illness that you're looking at. And the plug for my family, um, my son developed a really interesting approach that allows us to estimate genetic correlations. So this isn't just like a phenotypic correlation. Like we know that anorexia and OCD correlate, they're associated, we see them often together. This is actually on a genetic level 
asking to what extent are the mm -hmm. same genes operative across different traits or disorder. Um, either working in the same direction to increase risk of both, or perhaps working in opposite directions to increase risk for one and decrease risk for another one. And so um, it's called LD score regression, and that's what we're gonna look at now. This is a big picture. I'm putting it up there first. I don't even want you to pay attention to it because I'm gonna break it down by different color categories. This is basically the palette of significant genetic correlations of anorexia nervosa with other traits. We, we threw in almost 167, 168 different traits into this analysis and asked which ones are significantly correlated with anorexia nervosa. The trick to reading this is this red line down the middle is zero, no correlation. Everything on this side is a negative correlation, so one go anorexia goes up, risk for these goes down. Everything over here is a positive correlation. Now, the thing that's really cool about coming after these other speakers is you're gonna see on a genetic level how much, much of what was said this morning is actually mirrored genetically, which just gives me goosebumps. Um, so we'll start out with the green things. These are psychiatric personality and educational traits. And as you can see, all of these are positive genetic correlations, nothing over on the negative side. Highest genetic correlation with obsessive compulsive disorder, same genes operating to increase risk for both. Um, in, uh, positive genetic correlation for major depressive disorder, schizophrenia, anxiety, depressive symptoms, neuroticism, and this morning I'm thinking of Dr. Tan's converse, uh, talk, and she said some of those same traits that can make you a great cardiologist or whatever can also lead you to have an eating disorder. Lo and behold, positive genetic correlation with years of education, college completion, and attainment of a degree. So there is a genetic reason why these traits are actually walking hand in hand in people. And then we go to physical activity, metabolic and glycemic traits. And again, we've been talking about movement all day and physical activity and the drive to exercise. And lo and behold, we see a positive genetic correlation between objectively measured physical activity and anorexia nervosa. So something on a genetic level associated with that increased movement or drive to exercise is also underlying genetic risk for anorexia nervosa. And then on the other side, we're seeing these metabolic traits. We're seeing negative genetic correlations with some of the sort of less favorable cardiometabolic traits, type two diabetes, fasting insulin, leptin. But the good, the good metabolic trait, HDL cholesterol, we see a positive genetic correlation with anorexia nervosa. So what we're seeing is a metabolic contribution to this illness um, that might be affecting anorexia nervosa itself. Taking it one step further, and this is where I can look back and say I have been wrong my entire career. People have asked me since day one, is anorexia the opposite of obesity? And I have always said no. Anorexia is a psychiatric disorder and obesity is a metabolic disorder. That's not the case anymore. We know that obesity also has a psychiatric component and things that happen in the brain influence body weight and obesity. We also now know that metabolic and anthropometric factors also contribute to anorexia nervosa. So we have a strong negative genetic correlation with body fat percentage, fat mass, body max, mass index. All of these traits are negatively genetically correlated with anorexia nervosa. Um, where is this leading us? What does this pattern of genetic contributions mean? This is basically a genetic profile of anorexia nervosa. This is what underlies the illness. It is psychiatric, as you can see in the green, and it is metabolic, as you can see in the purple. And this is the revolutionary piece that is coming out of this genetic research. And this is one of the things that I don't know why I hadn't thought about this before. You know, sometimes some things come to you and you're like, well, of course, this makes perfect sense. But we all know um, that, and this is from a medical perspective, um, obesity, if your goal is to get someone to lose weight, 
Um, it's fairly easy to do that. You can put people on all sorts of diets and they lose weight, um, but then what happens within a year? They gain it all back, right? So the weight goes straight back up again. This is one of the reasons that we're trying to take an anti-dieting stance. But what happens with anorexia nervosa? Anyhow, their bodies try to go back to a higher set point. There's something about being up there. The body wants to get back and feels more comfortable in that settling point. For anorexia, um, anybody who works with patients with anorexia nervosa knows that you actually can get people to gain weight fairly easily, but then when you send them back out into the world without proper follow-up, without family support, the exact same thing happens in the opposite direction. It's like once their body hits that low set or settling point, there's something that pulls it right back down again. And up until now, I think we have been falsely criticizing, blaming patients for having this be psychological. They, want, they exercise too much, they want to lose weight, whatever. I don't think it's all psychological. There might be a psychological component, but I think what this research is showing is that there's also a metabolic component to this. Something about their bodies and their metabolism is pulling them back down to that low weight. So what does it mean? It means, as per my first slide, that genomic discovery in anorexia nervosa is accelerating. Finally, we have the tools and we're getting the sample size to be able to understand the fundamental biology of this illness so that we don't have to see so many relapses, so that we can identify people ahead of time with to whom we should intervene quickly. Um, and why, and I heard this mentioned in the audience, why negative energy balance is such a problem for relapse. There is something that happens, and we tell our patients all the time, you're well, you're recovered or recovering, whichever you prefer, but guard yourself against ever being in negative energy balance again, because there's something about getting in that state where you're expending more energy than you're taking in that might flip that metabolic switch again and make your body get you pulled back down to that low set point. Um, what we need to do is figure out why. So what we're saying at this point in the title of the paper that's coming out in Nature Genetics is that anorexia nervosa may best be conceptualized as a metabopsychiatric disorder. Um, we need to pay attention to both sides in order to understand the illness and perhaps, hopefully, um, to treat it better and most importantly, to eliminate deaths. Now, very relevant to FEAST and to FBT is does adequate renourishment need to be done in order to reset metabolism? You know, one of the things that we have anecdotal evidence in is that readmission to many programs is lower if you can get a person's weight up even higher than their projected weight based on their growth charts. And the reason that's important is some studies that we just did on the Ausbach cohort in the UK show that people who later develop anorexia nervosa have fallen off the growth chart as early as age two. So their growth chart might not be a good index of where we need to get them back to. Um, and I think I've heard such good language in this room today about the importance of finding that sweet spot where cognitions get better, where health gets better, and where risk of going back down to that low BMI um, is lower. So I think we definitely need adequate renourishment to reset that, perhaps Laura Hill, poorly wired metabolism. And then we have a long way to go. Content doesn't matter. This is where we are for um, GWAS and eating disorders. We've only done anorexia nervosa and we've only done the genome-wide association studies. So what? We identify eight loci. Um, that's just the beginning. And it's too few to start looking at how genes work together, what the biological pathways are, and actually getting deep into the neurobiology of the mechanisms that underlie this metabolic and psychiatric disturbance. But that ultimately is where we want to go, to look at gene pathways and to really look developmentally um, and neurobiologically as when these things happen in the brain that increases risk. This is how far behind we are, and we've heard this already this morning about how far behind we are in comparison to diabetes and whatever other illnesses. 
Depression, also in the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, they have 246,000 cases. Um, and that has allowed them to identify this many loci and really start looking at gene pathways that influence risk for depression. Schizophrenia, and this is already an outdated slide, their numbers just keep going up, 40,000 um, with 145 loci. They're starting to dig into the neuroscience of these genes and what they do. This is where we need to go. So, um, and this is just another picture of all the different psychiatric disorders and where we are in terms of genome-wide association studies, and unfortunately, as you can see, anorexia is down here. Um, this is schizophrenia, major depression, bipolar disorder. Um, we're really sort of scraping the bottom when it comes to our sample size. And how have we gotten here? Um, and this is probably my most, most depressing slide. Um, we have not gotten here via the help of the National Institutes of Health. Um, all of the research that you have seen um, has been supported philanthropically. All the way back from the Price Foundation studies that happened over 20 years ago that started us down this path to the Klarman Family Foundation supporting the Anorexia Nervosa Genetics, and Genetics Initiative, um, as well as the foundation, foundation of Hope in Raleigh um, and the Wellcome Trust. You can see here, um, this is a comparison of how much is spent at NIH, 73 cents for eating disorders per affected individual, 55 uh, $1.65 for autism, $86.97 for schizophrenia. So what you've heard here today is true. Um, there are data to support it. And one of the things that I think FEAST parents and FEAST members can do is lobby NIH um, to give us more money because this research is transformative. Um, it is going to change the way we understand, think about, and treat this illness. Um, but someone mentioned before, you can't do that work without money. And so we're going global. Um, we've gone from Angie for anorexia to Edgy for the Eating Disorders Genetic Initiative. Um, and what we've done for anorexia, we have to keep doing more to build that sample size. Um, but we also then need to do bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. It's a global. Um, it's a global initiative. Um, Ed Benet, who down here in the corner, he's somewhere in the room, um, is talking about the Eating Disorders Initiative. Thanks, Ed. Um, but we're going to stick with those four countries, but all these other countries in blue, and we were just talking to Russia yesterday about getting things started in Russia and getting more diverse samples. Um, but my personal goal is to catch up to schizophrenia and depression, to figure out this illness, and the thing that wakes me up every morning is to eliminate deaths from eating disorders because they should not happen anymore. And if we can figure it out on a biological level, maybe we can stop it that way. Um, this is we. <laughs> it takes a world, um, you know, and, and none of this could be done. It's not one person. It's one, not one group. It's really the whole world collaborating on this. Um, and you have my word um, that I am going to keep doing this work on your behalf and on your family's behalf um, so that we can really change um, how we see, how we treat, and how we prevent this illness. Um, thank you. Follow me. So uh, like last time, we've got some more time for questions now. Raise your hand. We'll bring the mic to you and hold it. Hi, Cindy. Um, so my question is, I'm assuming that the participants in the Agni pool are those who were diagnosed with typical anorexia nervosa at a low weight. Do you worry that this genetic research excludes people in higher weight bodies who also have anorexia? Actually, the opposite. The opposite is I can't wait till we also get that sample. Um, in fact, we've, we've, we have this survey that's the ED100K. Um, which is a way, we can't interview 265,000 people. So we need to figure out a way to capture it. Um, this, what we have now so far is low weight anorexia nervosa, or we need new words, typical anorexia nervosa. Um, but we also now have questions in that questionnaire that will capture, 
again, atypical anorexia nervosa. So one of the things that I want to do is I want to use the genetic information to see if there actually are differences between those two. Does it make sense for us to lump them together, or are they actually different entities or a continuum, um, or might they have sort of differential metabolic components? See, once we get the sample sizes, we can ask, answer those questions on a genetic basis. So that's my hope for that for that question. I have a little bit more of a comment, but I want to say thank you. I remember hearing you talk about the connection with schizophrenia in 2015, right. which is very prevalent in my family, um, right. as anorexia is on my husband's side, so yay, <laughs> genes combining. Um, but I am also the mother of a 24-year-old in a full, wonderful recovery who needed to be 110% of her personal mm -hmm. growth curve, who had to hit a BMI of 22, even though she'd never been over a BMI of 17 as a child. Yes. Um, and I just want to say, like, to me, there is no reason not to try more weight. There just isn't. 20 pounds yeah. over, 20 pounds extra isn't going to kill anybody, and right. five pounds under just might. Yeah. So thank you. No, no. I think that's a great story. It mirrors what we saw. I'm telling you, our jaws dropped when we saw those falling off the early growth curve. Um, in both boys and girls, by the way. Um, so it wasn't just females, but these young boys were falling off the growth curve as early as age three. Um, so how can you set a goal weight based on something that was never there, basically? So thanks for that comment. I appreciate it, Janie. I've had the pleasure of... I, can of, someone I'm raise their here. hand? I'm over ah, here. Yeah, okay, sorry. I've had the, the pleasure of lobbying NIH in the past for increased funding, and it's a very challenging road. But I would like to suggest that uh, FEAST provide a templated letter on mm. the website or somewhere that's professionally written by someone who can cite certain statistics and, and evidence, like as that. well as potential research projects to be done that are not yet funded. And then everyone here and all their friends and family can send that letter to their congressional members and representatives. That's beautiful. <laughs> yes. OK, we have a lot of questions. We're going to take some. That's a great the idea. We'll do that. We still have plenty of time for questions. You were talking about EDGY, and I'm just wondering how much funding, funding do you need to do that research? Um, we That's an offer of money, Cynthia. <laughs> Actually, talk to Ed, because um, we actually did calculate that out, and we're looking for about an investment of $10 million to do it. Um, that's pretty much what Angie was, if you include the genotyping. Um, it's not cheap. Um, you know, and good research isn't cheap, and I think that's what's, what's really important. Um, so we're, we're going at this in all different ways. Um, I, I do have a grant in at NIH. We got reviews back. They were good but not great. They, I mean, not immediately fundable. We're going to go back in. Um, believe it or not, there are still reviewers out there that don't believe eating disorders are biological. Um, you know, you get these comments back that's like, really? You know, I mean, People Magazine even knows it. Um, but sometimes the reviewers don't. So, you know, we're having to go multiple different ways. We're having to go NIH, um, European foundations, the UK, um, philanthropy, you know, every single way we can go. I'm a big believer in quilt funding. You know, you don't just get one big grant, you put little pieces together, and then eventually you get what you need. Um, and that's the approach that we're taking for EDGY. Yeah. Okay, we have time for two more questions. I was just corrected on my timing. Okay. So we're going to take one here, and then one up at the front from, we'll get to Dan in a sec. Wonderful. Thank, thanks, Cindy. Sure. Um, my question is, in terms of the disproportionate funding, I think one of your slides said, for schizophrenia, for yeah. OC, whatever it might be, compared to eating disorders, do you have a, a figure that you could put out there that you think is the incidence compared to those other illnesses? Oh, yeah, no. Um, I mean, prevalence-wise, yeah, anorexia and or eating disorders and schizophrenia um, are actually... So schizophrenia is lower than all eating disorders combined. Depression's really prevalent. Yeah, I mean, depression is like, you know, 25, 30% of people have a depressive episode in their life, so that's different. Um, but in terms of schizophrenia, autism, anorexia, they're all right around that 1% mark. So that doesn't explain the disparity in funding at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, throughout this morning and in, in your wonderful talk, we all heard, you, you talked about all the links between all the other depressive orders, OCD, mm -hmm. and so on and how they relate to eating disorders. 
And you can show that the OCD has the primary psychometric uh, correlation yep. to eating disorders. And yet, when you talked about the general wide studies, all of a sudden, OCD is all the way, nothing is known about it genomically. I know. I know. So the question, the question really is, is do you, do you think there should be general wide studies in these other, order, other disorders, yep. psychiatric, psychiatric disorders, and will they have... Uh, insight into what's going on in eating disorders? Yes, 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 yes. Great question. So, um, in fact, there is an OCD GWAS. Um, there's an OCD and Tourette's group. Um, their numbers are even smaller than ours. And it's interesting because in some ways, we've pulled the eating disorders field together really well to collaborate on this. I mean, this is like the biggest eating disorders collaboration ever. The OCD group is still trying to organize themselves in that way. Um, but we have one of my junior people, Zeynep Yilmaz, has done a combined anorexia OCD GWAS. So what you can do is you can put all of the anorexia GWAS data together and all of the OCD, or really anything, together, and you can say, okay, which genes come up above that red line that clearly contribute to both? Um, the sample size for OCD isn't big enough yet um, because we didn't get any hits, but that's what we're going to be able to do. Put them together in the pot, stir it, see what comes up. Because there will be some loci that are unique to anorexia, some that are unique to OCD, and some that clearly influence both. And I heard so many people already talk about the eating disorders gets well, but the OCD is still there, and then we need to, you know, use DBT or CBT or whatever. So, I mean, this is going to help us unpack on a biological level what comorbidity means. Wow. He likes holding them. Thank you so very much for that. I think that was a wonderful um, bookend to the dis to talking about we were talking about genetics and neurobiology, and that the two our two speakers related them so beautifully. Thank you. <laughs>